Spirit and our salvation. We've been, I've been talking, teaching some and looking at, we've been looking at the Holy Spirit, who is so often neglected by so many Christians, or so often dealt with in the wrong way and in an unbalanced way as well. The Holy Spirit is God. He is God. And He is God who is working in our hearts and working in our lives. So we continue this morning, and I want to just, by way of very, very quick reminder of what we talked about last week, we looked first at the Garden of Eden. God gave life in the Garden of Eden. He breathed life into man. And man and woman, by their choice, lost that life. Death came. They lost that life. And then we talked about God's response. Look at the next slide. What was God's response to man's failure? When we say man, we mean man and woman. Okay, we mean, we mean humans. What was God's response to man's failure? And God's response shows God's love, and it shows God's holiness as well. We didn't talk about holiness as much last week, but both of these parts, both the response that we see that God makes towards Adam and Eve tells us about the nature of God, the character, His very essence. God is many, many things. But what we see in the very beginning, this God of love and this God of holiness, these are the two, these are the two essential characters or characteristics of God. What did we see first? After Adam and Eve fell, what did God do? Did he say, forget you, you're on your own, you, you've blown it? No. What did God do? He looked for them. He knew what they had done. He knew they had fallen. He knew they had sinned. But he goes to the garden and he still reaches out to them. He still calls for them. He still looks for them. And that reminds us of what it says in the New Testament. It says that God is long-suffering. What's another word for long-suffering? Long That's the King James word. What's another word for long-suffering? Uh, persevering, but maybe another word instead in this situation. Patient. Patient is the best, would be the best translation. So some, some Bibles say God is patient towards us. Towards us. He's not willing that any should perish. That is not his desire. You know, people that sometimes you and I look at, maybe mass murderers or terrible, terrible people, and they receive justice. Maybe they are, they are, uh, they are put to death for their crimes or whatever. Many people, even many Christians, many of us, we look at it, we look at it, and our heart and our feelings are, he deserved it, right? We, we really do. He got what he deserved. We think of people like Hitler and, and other, and, and oh, people like that. And we think, well, they got what they deserved. It is amazing to me, and I, my mind can't really comprehend that God still looks at a person like that and that he's not willing that they should perish. He's not willing. His love is so great. His love is so great that if there's a chance, that if they would turn, that there would be rejoicing and that God would forgive and God would bring into his family. That's the heart and that's the love of God. And we see that in the very beginning. So, for the, so number one, he looks for them, and that shows us his love. What's the next thing we looked at? He's honest with them. God was so honest with them about, this is what your choice will bring about. This is what your choice has caused. He had told them before, he said, if you eat, if you eat, don't eat this tree from the fruit from this tree. If you eat it, you will die. God was honest, and God is honest. God is always honest. That's why, listen to him instead of to the enemy. The enemy, the enemy's talk with Eve and with Adam and both, it was filled with half lies and half truth. God speaks the truth. He will always tell you the truth. He'll always tell you the truth. You can trust him in that way because he loves us. He loves us. What's the next thing that we see? He deals with their immediate consequences. He provides, if you will, he provides a solution. We talked about that. Adam and Eve. Though there were just two of them in the garden, though they were husband and wife, though no one else was around, because of their sin, they now looked at themselves and they realized we're naked. We are unclothed. We are, we are not covered. And there was shame 
in the beautiful thing that God had made that had been twisted by sin. There is always shame in the good things that God has made when it's twisted by sin. And we see that in the world around us. And so God provided an immediate solution to meet their needs. And what did God do? He talked about this. He took, an, he took an animal. There had never been death in the Garden of Eden before. No animal had ever died. No animal had ever needed to die. But because of man's sin, the curse of sin, the curse of death, came and fell, not just on men and women, but on the world and on every part of God's creation. And God took an animal that had done nothing wrong, and he took it, and he killed it, and he skinned it, and he made clothes for Adam and Eve. What they provided for themselves was not good enough. Hiding in the bushes, using leaves, would never be enough. And that was God's immediate answer. But we know that was not the eternal solution, yet it pointed to the eternal solution. That one day, Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, would come and he would give his life on the cross for you and for me to cover our nakedness, to cover our shame, to take care of our sin, just as God did in type, in symbol, in the, in the Garden of Eden, Jesus Christ did in reality for you and for me. Nothing you and I could ever do would be enough to take care of sin. Doesn't matter how many churches we would go to. Doesn't matter how much money we would give. It doesn't matter what good things we could ever do. It will never be enough. It takes the blood of the spotless lamb to take care of our sin problem. And that's what God did. And that shows us his love. That shows us his love. And then what was the last thing that God did? And that was hard for us to understand as we looked at it. God did what? He banished them from the garden. He said, you must leave because the, the tree of life was there. God said, you must leave. You can't stay here anymore. You have to leave. And the Bible tells us we see two things. God told them they had to leave. And then if you read further, do you know what you see? It says God did what? He drove them out. They didn't want to leave. Imagine the heartbreak of Adam and Eve. God, don't make us leave this place. God, don't make us leave don't make us leave your presence because that was part of it as well god we have always you have always been our friend we've always walked face to face in the garden in the evening that's what the bible says there was this wonderful fellowship together with god and god said you cannot have that any longer not because i don't love you but because of sin and brothers and sisters that is still the same today. People around the world, in every country, no matter how good or no matter how bad, cannot have a relationship with God because he's holy when sin is not taken care of. And so God drove Adam and Eve out. That gives us a picture. That gives us a picture. So it's not just them. It's us, too. We cannot have access to the tree of life. We cannot have relationship with God because he's holy. And God drove them out. And there's no possibility of relationship. What does the Bible say? He put a cherubim with a flaming sword. How dramatic. To help us, he really did that. And it helps us to understand that the way to God was blocked. That that holy, the way, a, whole, a way of holiness, it was lost to them until Jesus came. And that tells us, that shows us the other part of God, that God is a holy God. He's a holy God. And, and to come to a relationship with holy God, we must have a relationship with Jesus Christ who takes away the sins of the world. That's why John the Baptist, the first record, one of the first things we ever see that John says publicly, he, he says, repent, there's one who's coming, he talks about the Holy Spirit, but one of the most wonderful pronouncements that John the Baptist ever makes 
We find it early in the Gospels. What does John say? We all know this. He sees Jesus. What does he say? Who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. That echoes all the way back to Genesis and the Garden of Eden. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the only way to the Father. And praise God that Jesus came. And that is why the writer to Hebrews says, it's recorded in Hebrews 4, this is the type of high priest that we have in Jesus, a one who understands us, and yet he was without sin. And then what does the writer to Hebrews say in chapter 4? I think it's in verses 16 and 17. He says, therefore, let us, what? What word? Boldly, boldly come. We approach the throne of mercy. Oh, imagine the throne of God. Most people think of the throne of God. It's a God. It's a throne of judgment. God, the throne, the power, and the majesty. And the writer to Hebrews says, let us approach the throne of mercy that we may find grace and help in time of need. Possible because of Jesus. Possible because of Jesus. And we see that. We see that. The way to a holy God is open again. And so when we look at that, we think of the love of God but we have to think of the holiness of God, too, because the price for that love to be expressed was Jesus. The way to holiness was through Jesus. And so we looked at that. But we also looked and talked about how, how do we receive this back? How do we receive this in our lives? It's through the work of the Holy Spirit. It must be through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's part of God's plan. What was part of God's plan? Salvation through Jesus Christ. How is it applied to our lives? Through the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the other part of his plan. And that's why Jesus comes in that night in the room that's closed. He breathes on the disciples. What does he say? Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. And Jesus breathes on these disciples. And for the first time, if you don't, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He never sinned. So, in, in, in flesh and blood, in our flesh and blood, in human in, in humankind, in our, in, in our world, for the first time since the Garden of Eden, first time, man could again have an open relationship with God. First time. After thousands and thousands of years. Receive the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit could do. That's what he came to do in their lives. And at that moment, they were regenerated. At that moment, again, life began. And then when Jesus was speaking, look at the next slide, he tells the disciples when he comes. Who? The Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. This is what the Holy Spirit will do when he comes. So if you and I are going to get saved, if you and I are going to have a relationship with God, before we can ever have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit's going to have to work. He has to. If the Holy Spirit doesn't work, you are not going to come to Jesus. So Jesus died for our sins, but and this is not heresy. Please understand what I'm saying. But that is not enough. Not a works that we can do. It takes then the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of Jesus in forgiving our sins and bringing salvation is enough. But it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to draw our hearts so that we can receive the full work of Jesus in our lives. When he comes, he'll convict the world of its sin, of righteousness and judgment. What type of word is convict? It's a legal word. It's a legal word and it means to bring to light, to expose to refute, to convince. So we talked about this. This is near to where we stopped last week. And I gave you, I told you the two stories. One of the stories of, of the young woman, uh, one of my students at Peking University, who became a Christian, led her sister to the Lord, led her mother to the Lord. And then the sister um, testified and witnessed to this young man in her office who kept on asking her out, go out with me, go out with me, go out with me. And she wouldn't because he didn't he was an atheist and he had, had nothing to do with God. And then one day the Holy Spirit did what? Convicted. Convicted. He did his work. He did his work. 
That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that young man realized, God has made this world. And then that young, young man realized, and um, I'm sinful. I'm sinful. And for a main, as, as I told you last week, for a mainland Chinese person to come to that realization, I am sinful. It's a, it's a, it's a big thing. It's a strong thing. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's God, and He does His work in hearts and lives. I gave you the other example. I didn't in the second service. I think I did in the first service. The other two friends of mine were young professors at the university that one weekend were finally convicted, convicted that what we were telling them was true. It was real. But those two young people, instead of responding, they rejected. Because they were Communist Party members, and they knew if we accept Jesus, people will know, and the doors of opportunity will close. We'll never get to wanting to go to America to study. He said, I'll never get to, he didn't say, it, say that to us, but we knew that's what it was. He'll never get to America. If you're a Communist Party member and you say, I'm a Christian, you have to get out of the Communist Party. If you do it publicly, you have to get out of the party. There's no way he would have gone to America. And they counted the cost, and at that point, for them, they decided the cost is too high. I pray for them still, because I love them. And I pray that they will still turn to the Lord. Because one day, if they do not, they will stand before the God who is righteous and holy. And they will realize the choice not to accept Jesus was far higher than the choice that we made. That's the work of the Holy Spirit while we have time in this world. Let's look at two New Testament examples. One of them is right after the day of Pentecost. Uh, have I got it on click, Amy? Give me just the first one. First one. Yeah, it's not. Okay, Holy Spirit's work. I don't, never mind, that's okay. Look at the top one first. When does this happen? This is Acts chapter two. So what has just happened uh, a few minutes earlier? This is Acts chapter two. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, the disciples, 120 of them and others, they were in the upper room. What happens? Holy Spirit. You say, wait, 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 wait. I thought Jesus said, Re receive the Holy Spirit. Yes, he did. But the Holy Spirit's work in salvation is one thing. The Holy Spirit's work in filling people is another aspect of his work. It's all the Holy Spirit's work, but it's not the same work. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, remember what Jesus said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1. You're going to go out, and before that, I want you to go out, I want you to be my witnesses, brothers and sisters. How could they and how can we be witnesses for Jesus with our lives and with our words in a world that really hates Jesus? Did you know that? They, you want to live for God? The world will mock you. They really will. You want to do what's right and be honest and upright and holy and all of these things? You will be mocked. You will be judged. You'll be criticized. You'll be a hater. You will be a... You'll be a, a, what's the word they use in America now? I look at my country and my heart grieves as I see what's happening in the U.S. Uh, uh, you'll be, you will be intolerant. That's the word. You won't be tolerant. You're an intolerant person. And they're going out into a world that is pagan, that they have no money. No money. This was the church. They were poor. And their leader is not going to be with them. Jesus is going to go back to heaven. They have no church buildings, by the way. They have no, uh, they don't have any of the things that we think are necessary. And Jesus says, you go out to the world, you preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I'll be with you. How, how is that going to happen? Jesus tells them, you're going to go, but wait until the Father and I, until we send the Holy Spirit, and then you will receive power, and then you will be my witnesses. So then we come to Acts chapter 2. What happens right before this? Holy Spirit has been poured out. Now, with me, put the two together. The Holy Spirit is poured out. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, you are you receive the outpouring, the filling of the Holy Spirit. You will be my witnesses. You'll have power to do what I've called you to do. And here, they stand up. They start preaching. What happens after Peter preaches and the others preach? Okay? There's a huge crowd, many, 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 
and it says Peter's final words of his sermon, he's uh -huh, in conclusion. How about that? He doesn't say in conclusion, that's what it is. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Now, that's verse 36. Brothers and sisters, if Peter is doing this on his own, let me tell you what's going to happen after verse 36. They are going to pick up stones, they are going to grab sticks, and Peter and the others are going to be beaten and probably stoned to death, just as others were later. That's what's going to happen after verse 36. That's what's going to happen. But what happens instead? Verse 37, <laughs> Peter's words did what? Pierced their hearts. That's something sharp and strong. It's like a, a knife going in. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Get the picture with me this morning. Jesus, Peter is preaching along with the others. The Holy Spirit is there in power. They've been laughing at them at first because they said, Ah, they're drunk. But the Holy Spirit keeps on working. They preach. And then what happens? Their hearts are pierced. Why does it say their hearts are pierced? And then they say, Brothers, what should we do? Peter has just said, God made Jesus Messiah and Lord. These are Jewish people, okay? This is before the Greek. It was preached to others who are not Jews. And they're, they're listening to the words of Peter. And you know what they realize? They realize the one that was our salvation, the Messiah. That's why, that's why Peter's preaching that. The one that, our, our, that was our Messiah. We've crucified him. What hope do we have? No hope. That's what they felt. There's no hope for us. We've killed him. We've crucified him. We've rejected the one that God sent. If we rejected him, what hope is there for us? And then they respond, brothers, what should we do? Now what we see here in these two verses is exactly, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not Peter's great words. Because you know what? Peter was not a great pre preacher. Peter, he, really, he's not. Peter was not particularly educated, if at all. When you look later on, um, Bible scholars, and I'm not a Bible scholar at that level of Greek and this and that, they talk about some of Peter's writings a little bit later, the letters that he writes. Peter doesn't even doesn't have good Greek. He's not, he's not educated. He's not smooth and polished, as Paul was, as we and when we come to him later. But Peter was preaching under the power of the Holy Spirit. What happens? The Holy Spirit does his work. He does his work. Listen. If you and I are full of the Holy Spirit and we share with people and we live for God, He will do His work. And so we see, what shall we do? And we know the result of that. 3,000 more plus are saved at that moment. So there's one thing that we see. Now, look with me at the second one. This is much later. This is... Uh, <clears throat> Mm, I have to figure out many, many, many years later, many, many years later, in Acts 24, we have moved from Peter, and now we look at Paul. And in this passage, Paul has been arrested. He's a prisoner already, and Paul has already, uh, Paul knows he's going to go to Rome, and let's look at what happens. A few days later, Felix, who is the governor of Syria, uh, Caesarea, sorry, of Caesarea, uh, Felix is the Roman governor, he's over there over, came back with his wife Drusilla who is Jewish so he knows some things about it already look at this sending for Paul they listened as he told them about faith in Christ Jesus next verse now remember what Jesus said when he comes he will do this as he reasoned with them about righteousness and self-control and the coming day of judgment those are things that the Holy Spirit would do, right? When he came, these are the, this is his area. What does it say? Felix became frightened. Why is Felix frightened? Why is he frightened? He's convicted. He's convicted. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul, if you look at his writings, Paul is so careful in how he talks. He's so careful in how he writes. Paul doesn't try to scare people or do this. 
Paul, of, of all the writers of the New Testament, Paul was the most educated. If, if we were, if Paul were here today, we would say, at least in the U.S., we would say, oh, Paul is Harvard educated or something like that. And really, because of his training, we would probably say in law or, or that's, that's the level. That's what we would look at. And that was Paul's background. He's not trying to scare anybody. He's preaching the truth. And he reasoned with them. Felix became frightened. Why? Because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Now, look at the difference here. As he reasoned, how does Felix respond? Because he does respond, he just doesn't respond in the right way. How does he respond? He became frightened and he says, go away. Go away for now. I, I don't want to hear anymore. I don't want to hear anymore. And so Felix is convicted, but he doesn't accept. But it's still the work of the Holy Spirit. Now look at what happens. What he says next is, when it is more convenient, I'll call for you again. Have you ever met people like that before? Hey, I, I really have. Now, the Bible tells us Felix wanted a bribe, okay? Felix wanted a bribe, so that's part of it. But you know what we see here? Felix says, uh, uh, when it's more convenient, I'll call for you again. You will often find in people, as you share the gospel with them, you will see this battle going on. There will be an openness, there will be a yes, and then there will be a pulling back and a no. And you will see this again and again and again. It's a yes, a no, open, close, respond, reject. And this can go on a lot. How many of you have seen that before? Have you seen that? I certainly have. If you are in a relationship with somebody like that, what should you do? You keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. And if you have a chance to, to testify, to witness to them, you do it. But you pray for the convicting work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And you pray for more power of the Holy Spirit in your own life to use, your, to, to use you and to speak through you to convict that person. Don't give up on that person. Don't give up on that person. God hasn't given up on that person. You don't either. You keep praying. And so we see the work of the Holy Spirit. In one, they respond. In another one, Felix rejects. And we don't know the final outcome of Felix. The Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible doesn't, at least while Paul was talking with him, Felix doesn't, never accepts Jesus. So we don't know. We'll find out in heaven, won't we? It doesn't, it doesn't look good for him, I will say. It, re it really doesn't. But God is such a good God. Remember? He's so patient with us. He's not willing that any should perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so our responsibility, brothers and sisters, is to, to preach the word by our lives and by our words. And when we do, in the power of the Holy Spirit, he will do his work. And some people will accept. And some people will respond. And some people will cry out, what should I do? And there will be others that say no. Or there will be others who say, not now. But the Holy Spirit keeps working because God is patient with us. And he loves us. And he's not willing. He's not willing that any should perish. Amen. Amen. That's his work before salvation. Now, what happens at the point when we get saved? So the Holy Spirit has to bring us to the place where our hearts open to Jesus where we are convicted. Because if we're not convicted, we're not going to do anything, are we? If we're not convicted, we're never going to say, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. If we're not convicted, our hearts will never open. And a lot of people come to that point and don't go any further, but they'll cry a few tears. Do you know, I've, I've seen people in church, they'll cry. I've seen people come to the front, I've seen people make personal commitments. I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to be better. There's going to be a difference in my life. But they haven't come to Jesus. And until they come to Jesus, the only one who can take care of sin, the devil is perfectly happy with our tears. The devil is perfectly happy with our good resolutions. I will be good. The devil is perfectly happy with our decisions to do better and to be better. The devil doesn't mind if we come forward or even raise a hand. He doesn't mind until our hearts are changed. Because anything short of that, anything short of that, and it doesn't make a difference. 
And so the Holy Spirit draws us to himself. And then we come to the point of salvation. We come to the point of salvation. I, I don't know. I wish I could sit and talk with, with so many of you, with many of you. And I often try to do that. When I meet people for the first time when they're Christians, I often ask them, how did you become a Christian? I love, I love to hear people talk about how they became Christians because they're all so different. Some of you, your parents were Christians. Some of you, you became Christians at university. Others of you, like Grandpa, he became a Christian very, very late in life because of grace. God's grace and grace, grace. <laughs> grace, grace that's sitting there. God is, so, God is so merciful, isn't he? God is so merciful. Who ever would have thought that Grandpa, a bad Buddhist all his life, would come to the Lord Jesus Christ. God is not willing that he should perish. We all have stories of how we've come. What happened at the moment that you became a Christian? What happened? A lot of us would just say, oh, I was so happy, and my heart changed. Almost everybody describes feelings of great happiness. Some, there are a few people that say, I didn't really feel very different. Does that describe any of you? Most people talk about a great feeling of change. But the feeling is not, that's, that's, not the, that's not the proof. That's not the proof. But what does the Bible say? The Holy Spirit does at the moment you and I become Christians. And let's look at that. We start with what Jesus tells Nicodemus. This is the Holy Spirit's work at salvation. Okay? The Holy Spirit gives us, first of all, He gives us new life. Jesus wins that new life for us at Calvary by taking our sins so that we have the, and dying for us, paying the price, and then living again. And then what happens at the moment we accept Jesus? God the Father works, Jesus the Son works, and God the Holy Spirit works as well. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water, that's probably the physical part, and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. So this is the work of the Holy Spirit. When you were born again, when new life came into you, it was the work of the Holy Spirit and the life of the Spirit. Do you remember when you were first born again? You entered into a new dimension, a supernatural life, a spiritual life. Now, I don't know about you. I want to know how. How many of you ever want to know? But God, how did you do it? Have you ever wondered that? But what happened? What was the mechanism? What was the step one, two, three? A lot of us, a lot of us are, are, are very, some of us say, I'm just happy, I'm born again. Others of us are pretty analytical. I want to know how. Well, I think Nicodemus was pretty analytical. You know, he was very educated. He was a, a legal expert, a religious legal expert. And so, obviously, obviously, if you look at this, Jesus is talking, you get the picture, it's nighttime. Jesus and Nicodemus are talking. Jesus is talking, and then we get right here, verse 7, and Jesus says, so don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. What do you think Nicodemus looks like at that moment? Have you thought about that before? Or whatever. I think he was surprised, right? He was surprised. And Jesus says, so don't be surprised when I say. Why? The only one who can give this new life? The Holy Spirit. It's his work. That's what he's come to do. Now, and we, but we want to know how, and we want to know why. Well, let's look at what happens next. John, uh, 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 John records the words of Jesus, and Jesus tells him a little bit more. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind. Okay? But can't, well, you could tell where that came from. It came from me. But can't tell where it comes from or where, where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. So that helps me a little bit. My mind that wants to know all of this. Jesus says, and I, I think he's telling the truth, you can't explain it. It's, just, it's, it's some, God's bigger, you know. It's a miraculous thing. And then Nicodemus is still trying to figure it out. Nicodemus says, what? How are these things possible, said Nicodemus. He still wants to know. And a lot of people do as well. A lot of people do. And that reminds me, remember the story I told you a month or two ago about this good friend of ours at Peking University that we, that we witnessed to for two years. Two years. And she was a mathematician at the top, one of the top, the top university. 
And she kept on trying to figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. Until that afternoon, she said, I want the Spirit of God in my heart. And that was all it took. That was all it took. We can't figure it all out. And he says, how is, are these things possible? We understand as best we can, but it's unexplainable, really. What we know is this. God has the power to give life. He has the power to give life. Amen. 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 And he gives life. And he gives life. And the Holy Spirit takes you and me where you were dead. He makes us alive. That's what happened when you were born again. That's what happened. Now, what else does the Holy Spirit do? And I don't want to make this, this is what the Holy Spirit does. I want, I want us to look at ourselves in this. What else did the Holy Spirit do when you were born again? So this is at the moment of salvation. Let's look at another scripture. The Holy Spirit changes our citizenship. You mean, oh, I'm no longer of Hong Kong? <laughs> kind of, yeah. Or Malaysia? Or, or Uganda? or Philippines, or what, or Togo, or whatever other country we are from. What does the Bible say? Colossians 1.11, and I've used the Phillips translation. I love this. For we must never forget that he rescued us from the kingdom and power of darkness and reestablished us in the kingdom of his beloved son, that is, in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. At the moment of salvation, through the power of the Holy Spirit, your citizenship changes. Your citizenship changes. Let me ask you something. You and I have passports from our, our, from our countries, okay? From our, our, our home countries. This is a tricky question, but anyway, let me ask you. If you could choose to be a citizen of any country in the world, would you change your citizenship from what it presently is? You could get a passport of another country. You could be a citizen of another country. Anybody? Anybody you change? Tom, what'd you change to? New Zealand. <laughs> New Zealand. More visa free travel on New Zealand passport than the other one. Okay, so he chooses, I hadn't thought of that one. New Zealand, more visa free travel. What happens if you become a citizen of New Zealand? Your rules change. You can operate differently. You have benefits that you didn't have before. Okay, that gives us a natural example. Anybody else, you change. Some of us would say, no, okay? But if you would change, and if you, what would you change to? Anybody? Not because you love another country more, but you know, you're thinking of maybe the benefits. Anybody else you might change? Oh, come on, be honest. Where, Juliet? Oh, that makes Pastor Renee so very happy. <laughs> Juliet says Canada. You know what? Juliet loves her country of Sierra Leone, but you know what? Because she is from Sierra Leone, there are many closed doors, aren't there? There are a lot of limitations for a, vari for a variety of reasons. Juliet loves her country, but there are limitations there. But if she's a citizen of Canada, then she has more. Be there are more benefits. There are more open doors. Okay, and that's just a, a reality. Anybody else? You might change it. You. You made me happy. Okay? <laughs> Why? There would be things you could do that you can't do as a, as a citizen of the Philippines. Now that's a natural, that's a natural example, but it helps us to understand the spiritual reality when the Holy Spirit changes our citizenship. You and I were in what kingdom? Yay, the kingdom of darkness. Who was our leader? The devil. Okay. In the kingdom of darkness, Satan, we were under his control. What was the end path of living in that kingdom? Death. Eternal separation from God. All of these things. Those were our benefits in being part of the kingdom of darkness. And then the Holy Spirit, when we come to him, when we come to Jesus, he makes it, he immediately changes us into the kingdom of light. The kingdom of his dear son. And our citizenship changes. I've told some of you before, uh, maybe it was, it was a long time ago, uh, we were talking with a, a, a German lady, a young German lady one time. She was a student or a teacher in Beijing many, many, many years ago. And we were all together in a Bible study, and Betty made, met, Betty made the statement, Sister Betty made the statement. She said, you know, we are Christians before we are American or German or Chinese. Or this or that. She made it was a very, a very strong statement, and that's and that is 
that should be true. That should be true for every one of us, no matter how much we love our, our birth countries as well. And it upset this young German lady so much, she came to Sister Baby and she said, and she wasn't happy about it. She's, she says, I, I don't think I can say that. I, 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 don't, I don't think I can say that. And Betty said, but it's true. We are, we are citizens of heaven. We become Christians. We, we have a new citizenship. And she really struggled with it. It was very hard for her to accept. She had a stronger national allegiance than she did to God. Brothers and sisters, listen. One of the reasons here in Lighthouse we choose to worship together with all of our colors, all of our languages, all of our backgrounds, and all of our countries is because we are citizens first of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. What does it say? What does it say? Um, it says, uh, look at the next one. He brings us, because he brings us into, let's go to the next slide. He brings us into the body of Christ, okay? And we see in 1 Corinthians 12, the body has many parts. The parts make up one body. So it is with the body of Christ. So it's citizenship. He brings us into a family. Some of us are Jews. Some are Gentiles. Some are slaves. Some are free. But we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit. And we share the same spirit. Then Galatians 3, 28. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, in God's church, in Lighthouse, in Lighthouse, let me make it more personal, the Holy Spirit worked at your salvation to bring you into one body, the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit continues to work to make you part of His body, where you love your brothers and sisters, where you accept your brothers and sisters, where you don't look down on your brothers and sisters or unduly elevate your brothers and sisters. We're part of the family of God together. And when there is division in the church, when there is looking down on, oh, they're from that group, they're from that country, oh, they are this or they are that, it has nothing to do with God the Holy Spirit because He has brought us into one body and into one family. And so as we live together in the family of God, with our new citizenship, I urge you, we urge you as pastors, fight against and put to death that natural part of you that makes divisions in Lighthouse. That makes you, I speak with some, but I don't speak with others. I'm with this person, but not with that person. We are this way, but we're not part of that group. He has changed our citizenship. We have the same citizenship. We're going to live in heaven together one day. Let's start doing that now. Let's start doing it now. Amen. Amen. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to end with one other verse, but we won't get all the way, but I want us to look at the verse because it's so wonderful. Let's look at the next one. The Holy Spirit identifies you as belonging to God. He did that at the moment of salvation. And I want us to look at this. This verse, I urge you, you can read it more on your own, but I want you to look at all of this together. Probably in the second service I'll get a little bit further. But I want you to look at this with me as we come to a close this morning. Here's the work of the Holy Spirit, the moment you got saved, and the ongoing work. And you also were included in Christ. He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth. He says, you're mine. At that moment, the Holy Spirit, when He gives you His Holy Spirit, it's an identity. It's an identity. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been around someone, you didn't know them, you didn't know anything about their background, but you were around them and you were talking with them, and there was something inside you that said, Christian, yes? On the train. On the train. Amen. That happened to me just the other day. I, I, I met this lady while I, was, while I was getting my car repaired and I was standing in the bus line, sweating, like a horse or something. <laughs> And we started talking. And I thought, there's something about her. There's something, there's something different. We started to talk. And, and I just felt drawn to her. And I, I said something about it. She said, well, what do you do here? I said, well, I'm a pastor. I'm, I, I work with the church. I'm a Christian. She said, and just, me too? Me too? And there was an identity. There was, a, there was an identity. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Oh, aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad for that? 
He identifies you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to go on through this as we come to a close, and I'll pick it up maybe later at another time, but I know some of you, most of you won't be in the second service. So let's look at the next one really quickly, Amy. The Holy Spirit seals you, having believed you were marked in him with a seal. He seals you. Okay. And that's a seal that has to do with identification. Okay. Has to do with ownership. And it also has to do with a completed work. How many of you, you have your government documents or you have your, when you rented your apartment or you bought your apartment or whatever, you did all the paperwork and then at the end, what happened? The stamp, right? The stamp came on your paper. What did that stamp mean? What did it mean? It's finished. It's done, right? Is there still pending? No, it's done. Price has been paid. Pen. It's, it's done. And so that's another picture to help us understand the work of the Holy Spirit. You are saved. You are saved. Are you completely changed in character and nature? Not yet. But you're saved. Does it mean you're 50% Christian? No. You're Christian. Does it mean you're 50% saved? No. You're saved. You belong to God. You belong to God. And what's the last part? Very quickly, the Holy Spirit is your guarantee or deposit. That's the last part of this in verse 14. The Holy Spirit comes into your life. So, Joshua, let me use you as an example, okay? Joshua, I'm just going to ask you in front of your mom and dad this morning. Joshua, are you a Christian? Oh, he was kind of quiet. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, Joshua is young. Joshua, are you perfect? Wait, mom and dad, is Joshua perfect yet? Not yet. Almost. <laughs> perfect or not, Joshua, the Holy Spirit lives in you. So he identifies you as belonging to God. He seals you. And then what else does he do? What is he? In your life, he is your, your deposit. He's your guarantee. He's your guarantee. And what does that mean? What that means is you belong to God. And one day, Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to take you to be with him. But I'm still struggling with, him, with some things. But the Holy Spirit is the deposit in you. And because it's a deposit, that means the full and final payment will be made. The full and final redemption will come when Jesus comes back. You're going to go. Jesus is going to take you to live with him. You're going to be with him forever. All that God promises is going to you. That's part of it. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And in the second hour, and in the next one, I'm going to go into more detail, or maybe later as well. But this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you sometimes feel you're not going to make it? Do you sometimes feel? Look inward to the Holy Spirit in your life. He is the seal, the guarantee, the deposit, the identifying mark that you belong to God. And God is going to keep you. And he's going to take you to be with yourself. Aren't you glad God sent the Holy Spirit? I sure am. Let's close in prayer this morning. Oh God, we thank you for your great plan of salvation. Lord, we look at your word. And we see you have thought of everything you have. You've thought of everything. You didn't leave anything halfway done. Even things that we didn't think about, you took care of it. And we're so glad. We thank you so much, oh Holy Spirit, for your work in our lives, in bringing us to the point of salvation, for bringing us into the family of God, for being the seal on our hearts and on our lives for identifying us with God and for being a deposit that guarantees one day the full redemption will come. Have your room, have your place, have your work in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. <laughs> Happy Father's Day again. Join us on the fourth floor.